Hey everybody, welcome to this week's live chat. I'm Angela Walters from Quilting is My Therapy and I hope that whatever holiday you celebrate that you had a great holiday season, a very happy December. We have been having some abnormally warm weather here in Missouri, so it's been kind of fun. Anyway, I was not here for a live chat last week. I had a very important appointment. I had to take my girls and some of my nephews to Science City at Union Station, so we had a great time. But I am looking forward to continuing the live chats throughout the next year. It's kind of fun. Um, these live chats started with the last challenge, or maybe the challenge before, and I just kind of liked it, so I kept on going. So even though our Fabulous Feathers Challenge is over, I'll still be going live on Thursdays at three o'clock central to talk about quilting things, except we'll just maybe ex talk about different topics than just the challenge. So for those of you that are participating, this week wrapped up the Fabulous Feathers Pre-Motion Challenge video series. Seven videos all about feathers. I just can't get enough. I love all the feathers. It was a day late, I apologize, but man, holidays happen, right? Um, so, but it did come out yesterday and I sent out an email. So if you haven't checked that out, it came out Tuesday and I sent out an email. So if you haven't checked that out, be sure to do that. And before I go live on my live chats, um, we type chat and a few people were like, oh, I haven't got to it yet. No stress, no worries. They'll stay on my YouTube channel until you're ready to do them. So definitely don't feel like you're behind because you're not, they'll always be there. You're right on time. Well, since we didn't have a live chat last Thursday, we're going to be talking about the last two weeks of the Free Motion Challenge, and it just so happens that it both has to do with borders. So we talked uh, a week ago about quilting feather designs in border corners. So we kind of tiptoed into the idea of borders and turning the corner, and I gave some options. And then this week I talked about design options for the panel, the border panel for the challenge. And whether or not you are quilting along on the panel, these are tips that will definitely help you. Now, as usual, I have lots of pictures to show and other things to talk about that maybe didn't make it in the video. If you're watching this live and you have any questions, go ahead and type those out in the chat. Jessica's here writing them down and I can answer those at the end. Um, being able to answer your questions live is one of my favorite parts. So I can make sure that you kind of are getting what we're talking about. So I have a few announcements and then um, we'll get right to the, the picture stuff. So. Uh, first of all, a couple of announcements, a couple of things coming up. Just want to make you aware that I have uh, my Thimble Therapy Retreat in April. So Camille Ross Kelly, great designer, uh, sweet friend of mine. We're actually teaming up together to do a retreat together, and it's going to be fun. Trunk shows, quilt making, uh, lots of good times. If you want to check that out, you can uh, check out Eternity Quilt Events and sign up. There's only like 20, sp 20 spots left. So if you're interested, go ahead and check that out. Uh, I don't get to I don't travel as much as I used to for obvious reasons, but I'm looking forward to this event. So it's in San Diego, San Diego in February when I live in Missouri sounds heavenly. So super excited about that. We will be closing registration for Build a Quilt. That is our block of the month program um, where you get to make a customized quilt, picking your colorway and your layout options. That's gonna close in just a couple days. So if you've been kind of hesitating, be sure to sign up for that um, or you can catch it the next year when it comes around again, so excited. And we do have a few more of the luminous or the fabulous feathers notions. So we have a couple needle nannies, some scissor uh, fobs, those kind of things. So if you want something to commemorate finishing this challenge, you can definitely check that out. Um, they're on the, the link is in the description box below. All right, those announcements out of the way, let's talk about quilting. I have had so much fun talking about feathers. It's one of my favorite designs. And it's kind of interesting because quilting borders is one of my least favorite parts of the quilt to work on. So it's kind of like, I love the design, but I don't necessarily like this area. So it was kind of fun to kind of, kind of psych myself up for quilting this area. The reason I don't love borders is when I started quilting for customers, I would quilt them all in my long arm and I'd start on that first border and I'm like, oh, I'm going to make this the best quilt it's ever been and do something really ornate and over the top. And by the time I get to the last border, I'm so over the quilt, I want to be finished. And I'm like, oh, now I have to do this design again. Um, and then it's also tricky to know how to work your way through the quilt. So I'm going to give you some options. And of course, again, if you have questions, you can let me know. We'll, we'll definitely hit those. So let's talk about turning the corner, right? I, I love saying like quilting borders is all fun and games until it's time to turn the corner and turning the corner doesn't have to be tricky it doesn't have to be difficult and there's a couple different options you can go about it so when I do my videos I like to show different skill levels this is maybe the easier quicker option this might be a little bit more thinking involved and the first option was just to divide that border corner in half and split it up into two and to quilt it and so here you can kind of see from the challenge quilt kind of just dividing up that corner this is great if you don't want to think about turning the corner you don't want to have to worry about taking that design and wrapping it around and it works with 
all designs, not just feathers. So this is a technique that you can apply to any design you're using for your borders. I would say that I would use this in thinner borders, four to six-ish inches. Once you get really wide borders, it can be tricky to quilt that feather big enough, and so a different option might be better. But this is something you could even do for sashing around your blocks. Now these are just some screenshots from the expanded resources. So if you purchase those, this probably looks familiar, uh, but I just kind of break it down for you a little bit. In the video, I show you how to mark some reference lines to kind of keep you on track, and that is completely optional. I love to do that when I'm teaching. That way, if a new person's watching, they can really kind of see what's going on. I don't necessarily mark those out when I'm quilting a quilt. So don't feel like you have to mark the reference lines, but for those of you that are a little nervous about it and want a guideline, you can do that. And the first reference line that we would mark for this is just to imagine that I have a line from the inner corner to my outer corner. And that's gonna be the pivot line. So if I am turning the corner, I'm gonna use that as a reference, but for here, it's more like a boundary. It's just kind of dividing the two and making it where I can fill it in. You can use this technique with either feather, but I especially like it with the basic feather because that teardrop goes to the end, kind of fills it, and then you can fill in that area with your regular feather. So, but you can do it with both. What's neat about this, if you want the feathers to face each other, that's just gonna kind of maybe draw attention to that corner. So this might be a great option if you have border corners that are around a really, um, something in the middle that maybe isn't great or you know, just you're not worried about taking away from the center of the quilt. Or if you have somehow a lot of borders coming together in the center. So that might be why I would do this. But another really fun way is to quilt them going the same direction so that it almost looks continuous. This is my favorite because it looks like I'm turning the corner, but I'm not. I'm quilting one feather and then quilting the next. And for those of you that are maybe newer to machine quilting, it just kind of gives you a clear start point, stop point, and continue on. The trick here is I am gonna hook my second feather into my first one, and I'm gonna have this weird unquilted area. I'm gonna make sure that my petals kind of fill that in. So no matter which technique you use, those petals in the corners might be a little differently shaped. It kind of has to be that way because there's more area. So don't worry about that but you, you get this cool effect turning the corner. In the video, I kind of talk about that. In the handouts, I colored the feathers two different colors so you can see them independent of each other, but if you were using the same color, it would just look like one, one particular one. The next one I showed is a favorite of mine where it looks like the feather runs on and off the corner. Now, this kind of is similar when we talked about quilting irregular areas, but what I love about this is it kind of gives you a fun, whimsical look with that feather, but again, you don't have to worry about turning the corner. So in this, we talked about marking more reference lines, but also kind of filling in and making them look like they're hooked together. So here we can see those reference lines in the corner. It's easier, in my opinion, to quilt two different sections that look like they're running, into, running off the thing, but just because it's easier or it's a shortcut, I don't want it to look like a shortcut, right? I'm not gonna give it to the customer and be like, hey, I did this because it was easier. No, I'll say something like, I love the artistic way that it just flows off the area. So I want it to look good, even though it's quicker. So again, adding that second reference lines, the one that kind of turns it into a square in the center, in that corner, make sure that I don't get too close to the corner. I want to veer off before I get to that point so it looks like the feather actually is running off and then coming back on. When in doubt, I would rather run off before I get to the corner, like sooner than later. And um, I want to try to go in at a 45 degree angle. Now, I like to think of all these little teaching points, these little talking things that I can share, but sometimes I make things that are pretty easy more difficult. So if you're thinking like, I can't remember all that, just quilt a spine, run it off the edge. There you go. But if you want a little more fine tuning, kind of going off at an angle and stopping well short of the corner will, will I think, give you the best results. Now, in the video, there's so many different ways that you could do this, right? You could quilt one whole section and then the next section. You can do your spine and spine, kind of like I did. Don't feel like you have to quilt it in the arrangement that I show. You can make it fit your preferences and what you want to work through. So don't feel like, oh, this is how she did it. I have to do it that way. It just depends on your preferences and, you know, the quilt you're working on and the machine you're working with. Now, since they are supposed to look like they're running off the edge, I want to make sure that my feather is going the same direction, right? So if this is the bottom over here and the top, I'll have the bottom and the top 
if that makes sense. This works with both kind of feathers, so it doesn't have to just be the custom feather, but that's just the one I chose to show with it. And then as an added little funsy kind of thing, if you want to make them look as though they're connected, you can add some arcs around the corner or the edge from one to the other, and that's just gonna kinda look like those petals are hooking it together. You can make these bigger if you have a bigger area, or you can leave this out altogether. It just kinda depends on what you're working with. I will tell you, an added benefit of doing this makes the hand binding much easier. Not that I hand bind or bind at all, but if I'm quilting a dense swirl filler, um, having that all the way up to the edge makes it kind of hard to hand bind your quilt, but you have this less dense around the edge and then your filler in the middle. So just an unintended perk. Then once you have your sections, then you can fill them in. You can add your echoing and your filler, and it really depends on you know what you want to put in there. And then lastly, we went with the traditional option where we're just going to turn that corner. And this is going to be great for borders that go all the way around your quilt where you want to give a framing element or you just want that traditional feather look. Sometimes we just want that pretty look. And so what's going to happen is we're going to quilt it just normal in the border, but when we turn the corner, there's going to be more area in the corner than in the border. So we have to kind of deal with that irregular area. That's the only little thing you have to think about. And so when I did it, I kind of showed when you go around the outside or the outer part of your feather, you're gonna have more space. So that border corner is gonna give you more than normal. So those petals are gonna be longer and that's fine. They're gonna be a little bit bigger, no problem. Don't, don't worry about that. And since the curve is kind of coming towards you, you won't have to travel as far along the spine as you normally would. So you'll quilt until you merge into the spine and then come right back out. Think of it almost like that corner where you quilt those petals is gonna be like a pivot point. Um, so usually that's not the hardest part, or at least it wasn't for me. When I started quilting feathers, I could make them a little bigger. That wasn't the problem. It was the inner corner or the inside that gave me trouble because when you're going around the inside of the curve, you have less room than the outside. So your petals aren't gonna be necessarily smaller. They're gonna kind of lay over each other. And so I don't know, I didn't say this in the video because it doesn't really make sense. So I'm hoping I can explain it live. I'll quilt along that spine until I'm getting ready to run into it, right? The spine's curving, I'm getting ready to run into it again. So the next one is gonna curve out and lay on top of the other. I don't know if that's the exact right way to explain it, but that's how I kind of see it. That pedal comes out and it flops over and it kind of makes me go the next direction. So play around with that a couple times and you can kind of get the hang of it. But here you can see I've quilted it and then that next one's gonna lay over. These are actually out of order, so now you can see that next one. So just know that when you get to the corner, you're not gonna have as much space and your, your feather's gonna have to curve. And so you're gonna have some that look a little different. It's okay. Just make sure the area is filled in, try to keep them similar in size and move on. It's gonna be fine, especially if you're using a thread color that blends in. And this technique works great with the custom feather and the basic feather. Either one is fine. Just use the one that you feel more comfortable with. So if I kind of get a closer up of this, the custom feather in that corner, you can see that one just kind of flopping over and a couple of bigger ones in the corner. The biggest trouble with this is if you have really large borders or larger borders and you're wanting to turn the corner, you might have some unquilted areas in between your petals or in between your petal and the edge of the area. Just use echoing and fill it in. If you've watched any of the videos, you know I say that all the time. Just echo, fill it in, it's all good. And here you can see, again, the basic feather. So pick the feather you're more comfortable with when you try going around the corner. You can mark it out if you want to, but try to get comfortable with, without doing it because usually <laughs> when you get to that point, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, I just need to go on. And, and sometimes I would take time marking it out and then not actually follow the lines once I got there. So it is what it is. One option I didn't show, it didn't make it into the video because it was getting pretty long, is you could just ignore that corner altogether and quilt your petals or your feathers so that they keep going the same direction. This is not gonna work for every quilt um, or every design, but definitely if you have um, you know, a quilt with bigger borders, something that you don't mind that little bit of a funky look. And so here I've just quilted them diagonally and kind of you know, ignored that corner. But if you think about it, if you're quilting feathers horizontally, you can keep them going horizontal in the sides too, right? So you don't have to make that feather go in a different direction. And that works with any design as well. And again, if you're just learning how to quilt feathers, you want to throw a few in there, it's gonna make it a little bit easier. So you don't have to change direction with your design. But all that being said, um, it's, it's whatever you decide that you wanna do. So there's no wrong answer here. Just fill in the area and move on. 
Then this week we talked about the borders. So this one was fun because I got to quilt the border panel for the challenge border or challenge panel. So if you didn't purchase that, no problem. You're already done with your panel or if you're not quilting on the panel, you're already finished. But these are um, tips that can help you no matter what quilt you're working on. So I hope it was helpful. When you're dealing with borders, there's a couple things to think about. When you're quilting the whole thing, do I do it all at once or do I do it in chunks? It depends, right? It always depends, it's up to you. Um, in general, I like to quilt my borders as I go. So I like things that can be broken up into chunks so I can quilt border, center, border, and continue on. However, if you are more of the personality where you just wanna quilt the same design until it's done, you can save it and do it all at the same time, whether at the beginning or the end. There's no wrong answer here. But the options that I've shown you here are how I prefer to do it, which is breaking it into sections. And the first one I talked about, and here's another quilted picture, the first one we talked about was motifs. So I kind of envisioned this lesson as kind of like a, um, a sampler of all the earlier ones. We talked about motifs and filling in irregular areas and turning the corners, which kind of takes all that and puts it on an actual part of the quilt. Um, first of all, the motifs are great because it just lets you deal with a defined area, quilt it and move on. You don't have to worry about hooking them in later. You don't have to worry about connecting them and you can do so many different kinds of motifs. I know that we saw that in that earlier video, but man, you can really, really have fun with it. The main thing I wanna talk about though is when you're working along your border, if it's the outer border, the edge, chances are you're probably gonna bind your quilt. Um, not everybody, I. I always say I'm gonna bind it and then I don't end up binding it. I have a lot of raw edge quilts laying around, but I need to remember that I'm gonna lose at least a quarter inch of that border to binding. So when I'm dealing with something like motifs or feathers, ornate kind of designs, I really, really wanna make sure that I don't run it off to the edge because I'll cut off those petals. In fact, I like to give myself plenty of room. So if you look here, I've got a good inch between the top of my motif and the edge of the quilt. Because if, if I have to square the quilt up or if I have to trim it, do something, I wanna make sure there's plenty of wiggle room. I don't wanna have to cut off my pretty, my pretty feathers. So I always stop well short and then use filler to fill in the rest. Not always is this gonna be the way you wanna do it, but just be sure that you remember that binding. And even if you keep it right at a quarter inch, sometimes it's scary because again, if it has to be trimmed and squared up, you could lose it. If that happens, no worries, just say you did it on purpose or give it some like, you know, reason. But for the most part, I'm gonna leave myself some space. In the video, I showed how to do a half motif and we talked about, you know, basically using the border edge as my spine. But for bigger areas or if you have a little bit more room, you can do full motifs. So the reason I started with the half is there wasn't, it wasn't a large border and I wanted to do something that was a little bit easier. In the expanded handouts, I kind of had a fun time with it. I was like, trust me, it's not fun trying to quilt a overly ornate, ornate motif in a small border. So don't try to do anything too ornate if you're only working with a four inch border, you can't fit a whole lot in there. I would much rather do a half motif or something more simple like this and then fill in around it than get stuck cramming it in. So um, just an aside there, I've, I've ran into that a couple times. When you're adding your motifs, you can put them in your borders. I wanna make it symmetrical though, cause I think symmetry looks perfect. So if I put one on the top, I'll put one on the bottom. Or if I put one on the side, I'll put the other on the side. I didn't do that in the challenge panel cause it's a practice piece, but on an actual quilt, I wouldn't do something different in each of the four borders. I want it to be somewhat symmetrical. So at least two, if not all four sides. But you don't have to always center it. I could do two on the top and two on here. I could, you know, play around with that. Definitely find what works for you. You can mark you know, your kind of reference lines, but usually I'm gonna use some kind of element of the quilt to give me a guideline. So if I have six blocks, I can look for the middle of those and I know that that's somewhat towards my middle point. So look to your quilt for those references. And I also love to do it, quilt them on the borders. So you could even just put a pretty motif on each of the corners and call it good. So um, I showed, talked a little bit about how to quilt those, those corner motifs again. Same thing, I'm quilting the center, I'm adding my petals, I'm leaving it short of the edge and using filler to fill in that unquilted area. Again, because I don't wanna lose that pretty look. Now the design of the panel has these curves with the, the blue area, so I just wanted the petals to somewhat follow those. So as the area got smaller, I just quilted my, my petals a little bit smaller. And what's really fun is you can make these as long as you'd like. I just quilted until I ran out of room and stopped, but you can, you know, 
whatever you want to do. You can make them as long or as short. Doesn't matter. Just do the same on all on the other ones. All right, so just another angle of that pretty corner motif. This is like the cheat code, I think. If you want an elegant look to your quilting, but you want it to be done quicker and you don't want to have to think about connecting them, throw some pretty motifs in the border. It's actually pretty quick once you get the hang of it and you just kind of get this really cool look. And so then when you show people or give it to that person, they're like, it's amazing. You could say, I know, it's great. But you don't have to tell them it was easier. All right, you can also do this with both kinds of feathers. So this one is the basic feather motif where we're adding those half heart shaped petals. Um, I would have loved to fit a full motif, but there wasn't quite enough room. So I just did the half one, but you can do a full one too. Again, it just depends on, you know, it's like a choose your own motif quilting adventure, whatever you wanna do. And again, another picture of that. I say in almost every video, and I, I know I don't probably have to, but I wanna make sure it's clear. In the videos, I use a contrasting thread so you can really see what I'm doing, right? That's the point. If you're gonna use it as a tutorial, you kinda need to see what's going on. Quilting with bright red thread on a gray border is really gonna draw attention to anything in that feather. So just know that you wanna use a blending thread color or something similar in value if you don't want that to pop out and take over the quilt. I will tell you, as an honest admission here, when I was quilting, especially, you know, I've got the camera here and I'm trying to quilt on the long arm, I was like, oh, this isn't looking so great because of that thread shows everything. I left it on, didn't point it out, but I'm just saying using a matching thread color will cover a multitude of quilting sins. So don't use red thread unless you're, you know, filming a tutorial or just want your quilting to be really obvious. And I know we already saw a picture of this, but look for your piecing or look for elements of the quilt that you can join together with that motif. So here I've used that gray kind of stripe. Love that like kind of ombre effect. And so I used it kind of as the spine of my motif. This is a great option if you're quilting applique or maybe applique borders. I love doing that, incorporating, you know, those pieces into the, the design itself. So you can have fun with that and really kind of play around with the placement. All right, the second option I showed was talking about quilting your feather in sections, but hooking them together, making it look continuous without actually quilting it continuously. And this is one of my favorites too, because it's like, okay, I can quilt a section, move down, quilt another section and hook them together. The good news is when you're working with a feather, one side is pretty easy to connect because you're kind of building off of it. The other one, not quite as easy, not difficult, but not quite as easy because I'm quilting towards my previous one and I need to be able to fit them together like I, did, um, like I did on that top border. So again, when I showed it in the tutorial, I showed a particular arrangement of how to quilt it because that was easy for filming, but um, it's up to you. You can do it in any arrangement that you'd like and then we also saw a little bit of turning the corner. If you like to go this option, this corner is gonna be a little bit of a steeper curve, a little more of a turn than what we saw. And so again, you're just gonna quilt your petals so that they fill in that inner corner and just trust that you can use echoing to fill in any unquilted areas. So let's talk about that. So since the design of the border looks like it's kind of going on and off, my spine is gonna kind of show up and not show up. And so here I've quilted just the spine of the corner the reason I have this kind of in here is I want to show you when I'm turning that corner with the spine, I'm kind of trying to keep that spine towards the middle of those two corners. So I'm trying to split the difference as much as I can, just because it'll make it easier on me. If, I, if, I, if it's too far away or too close, then one side of my petals are going to be really small and really big. Not the end of the world, but it just makes it easier for me, more similar on both sides. And then you're going to quilt your petals like you normally would, it, whether they're the basic feather or the uh, more custom feather. But then as you come to the neck, the one you previously quilted, you're going to want to join those together. So the way that I do this sometimes makes people very, very nervous. So if, if I demonstrate or if I talk through this and you get a little bit of like itchy on the back of your neck, you don't have to do it this way. What I'll do is I don't even worry about that other feather segment until I'm a couple inches away. Right. So don't even stress out about it until it's right there. Then when I'm a couple inches away, I'm going to take a second and just kind of approximate if I keep going how is this going to end up right am I heading into a train wreck or not I just want to know so at this point if I wanted to I could mark out a couple of those petals and then if I had too much space or not enough I can either shrink my last few petals a little bit or enlarge them a little bit to fill in that area the idea being I can take that difference and spread it out over a few petals so it doesn't look noticeable 
as opposed to getting to the end and having a really tiny petal or a really large petal um, that will be a little bit more noticeable. In, in theory, I want them to be more similar in size. So as I get here, and it worked out just fine in the video that two petals pretty much filled it the way it needed to go. But again, if I needed to, I could have done you know, three smaller ones or I could just spread it out. The idea being that once you're done, as long as they run into each other, once you step back, all you're gonna see is that pretty feather. You know where they connect, but other people aren't. So don't point it out. You don't have to say, oh, look right here, they don't connect very well. It's fine, our eyes see perfection in other people's stuff. So other people will look at it and just be amazed. And so that's kind of the, the trick to it. That's the same whether you're doing, you're joining up ribbon candy, whether you're joining up a full feather, you're just gonna get close a couple inches away and then spread out the difference over a couple of diff, you know, over a couple of the pieces. That's gonna make it a little bit less noticeable. Again, if that stretches you out, you can go ahead and mark out the whole feather so that you're sure to know how they're gonna end up. But again, it, it's just easier to do it that way for me. So just a couple more pictures of that. In the blue curves, I added some other motifs. I didn't really talk too much about these because it wasn't necessary. I mean, we've already kind of seen those half motifs. But the one thing I did say in the video is I, like to, I don't like to start my motifs on the, cor the edge of the border. So the idea being like if this is my top outer edge, I don't want my center to start there because I have to worry about that quarter inch. And there's also a lot of traveling. It's just not fun. So I, I try to not do that. And plus, where those lines come to, usually draw your eye. So usually, you want your eye to come towards the center of the quilt, not the outer edge. That was just a little throwaway tip in there I put in there. I'm just like, that's just my own opinion. And again, um, using that filler to fill in those unquilted areas. If this wasn't the outer border, if I had another border that was going to be there, I might take it all the way to the edge. It just kind of depends. And here you can see the same idea, um, same motif, just facing a different direction. So this one was kind of facing down. And that one's kind of on the curve, just kind of a different direction. And I kind of played around with more thread colors. So I was done filming, but I wanted to finish in the rest of the border just for fun. And if you don't want to do motifs, you can just quilt sections of your feathers. So I just kind of quilted as though that gray was a spine and just quilted a half feather. So definitely play around with it and find you know what works for you. I know I say that a lot, and it's funny because um, people are like, if I knew it worked for me, I wouldn't need this video series. But I just want to encourage you that there isn't just one way to do it. Um, I'm gonna answer your questions here in a second, but I did write down a few that came up on the type chat before I went live, and, and Ellen commented, she said that she loves that I say I'm only the expert of my opinion. And I was like, well, it's true. Anything that I'm teaching is just how I do it, so don't feel like, oh, I gotta do it Angela's way or it's not gonna be right. I never wanna perpetuate that, that idea. I want you to feel confident that you can kind of put your own spin on things. Okay, a couple questions that came up on type chat. Kathleen asked, how do I use a straight ruler to quilt along the curve? And in that last tutorial, I kind of talked about, I'm gonna quilt along this edge. Basically, if it's a gentle curve, I can use a straight edge ruler because a curve is just a bunch of straight edges changing direction. So I'll quilt a little bit, reposition and reposition. So the answer is in short little bits and repositioning a lot. And even though it's kind of little broken up it'll still follow that curve so I think I talked about that in the rulers challenge so you could check out that it's it's a fun little trick if you need to stitch in the ditch around those gentle curves and you don't have the right curve for it right curved ruler for it all right Janice asked is there a filler design that's easiest for new quilters she was like I'm trying to fill in I don't I can't get this feather meander what can I do the idea is the easiest one is the is different for everybody. I have heard lots of people say that I love the stipple meander and just as many other people say I can't do that. So the idea is, is there's something that you already doodle? If you already kind of doodle loops, that's usually the easiest one because a lot of the cursive writing that we do are loops and we can kind of imagine what that looks like. If you kind of do little swirlies or whatever, so if there's something that you already kind of doodle, start with that, um, but that being aside a, a loopy meander or a meandering line would be the easiest I would say because the shape is very repetitive it's not so many steps but I've taught several classes and I've seen people find swirls way easier than any other filler and other people find swirls the hardest of them all so everybody is different which makes it kind of fun um, Sarah said is there are there tips for quilting around or quilting bulky seams so if you're quilting especially well on a sewing machine and a long arm those bulky seams can be trouble because there's a lot more layers of fabric and 
especially on a sewing machine, it can be hard to get through that. So if I'm dealing with bulky seams, I'm gonna probably try to avoid them as much as I can. So think of like an eight point star that comes in the center. It doesn't matter how well you piece that, that's gonna have some bulk. So I'm not gonna do stitching in the ditch in that. I'm not gonna quilt a continuous curve that goes to that point. But I'm going to also not quilt really close and then go away because if all my lines come close but don't go over it, I'm going to get nipples on my quilt, like little spots that poke up. So I might do something a little bit more gentle all around it. I know that's kind of a vague answer, but um, the idea being if I can, I'll try to at least get one to go through there. If I can't, I'll avoid it altogether. But I won't get really close to it and avoid it. I will just do a big meander. Um, another thing that will help you on your sewing machine, if you have a dynamic free motion foot, one that kind of hops a little bit, that will help you because you won't feel like you're running into it. It'll kind of help you ease over it. So um, I know that those bulky seams can be, can be a pain sometimes. And then Mary Rose had a great pointer. I just wanted to share it because um, there are people who are like, oh, I just, I feel like I can't master it. I can't get it. And, and she said, if you have kids or friends that are trying to master a difficult subject or an instrument, you probably have told them, don't give up, keep at it, keep practicing. Well, you have to kind of take that own advice for yourself. So if you are quilting along and you're frustrated, don't be. It just takes practice and remind yourself or talk to yourself as you would talk to somebody else. You're doing great. Keep it up. It just takes practice, I promise. So those are the questions that I have. Um, Jessica's writing down a few more and she'll give them to me. I want to tell you that the live chats will continue. Next week's live chat, I'm going to talk about quilting panels. So with the Luminous Fabric Collection, I had some pillow panels. So we'll talk about some tips on how to quilt that. I'll give you some suggestions. And then the next week after that, I'll give some tips for long arming. That's something I've been talking about a while, been promising, and we'll do it. So I know not everybody uses a long arm, but you might find it interesting to see how it works. So I'll, I'll kind of share some practical tips on long arming. Um, I went from hand quilting to long arming to quilting on a sewing machine. So I always say that quilting on a long arm is like my first language. Okay, so some great questions came up. Again, if you watch the videos live, you can type out your questions and I'll answer them live. If you're watching this later, just leave them in the comments because I get on there from time to time and answer them. And also, if you like the challenges or the videos, be sure to give it a thumbs up, the video thumbs up. Okay, how do I avoid getting too much thread built up on the spine of the feather? So this is gonna happen because I am gonna run into the spine, travel up and then continue on. If you're using a matching thread color, it's not gonna be noticeable. But if it is noticeable or you find that it's getting too thready, too much thread buildup on that spine, stop just a little short, just a bit. I mean, just so like an eighth of an inch, just so that there's not thread on top of each other, that will kind of help it from getting built up. In the troubleshooting feathers video, I talk about how I like to leave a spine in, or an echo line, a space in between my spine because it helps spread it out a little bit. So that might help you as well. Again, it is gonna be thread heavier in the center. That's how the design works using a matching thread color will help. All right, what color of thread did I use for the bobbins in this challenge? I used a gray thread in the bobbins. So I like pre-wound bobbins. They're very addicting. So if somebody offers you one, don't say no, because they're kind of like drugs, you'll be addicted to it. So I use the light gray bobbin because it just it's the same general neutral value as the front. If I wasn't using pre-wound, I would use a similar color in the bobbin. So if I'm using light gray in the top, I'd use light gray in the bobbin. If I'm using the haze purplish blue on the top, I'll use the haze purplish, I'll use a similar color on the bottom. The fun thing about machine quilting is you can use different kinds of thread, different types of thread. That's not important, but I, tried, I would try to keep the color similar. That will um, help prevent any pokies from showing up, you know, like those areas where the bobbin thread shows up on the top. It just looks better. All right, when and what is the next challenge? I'm hooked. I love that you guys are so excited. I got to tell you, um, Jessica knows this from experience. It's quite the ordeal to put out a challenge, right? There's the design, there's the production, there's all the things. And when I filled out, when I finished the video on Tuesday, I was like, oh, I'm so glad it's over. Not glad the challenge is over, but glad that my responsibility is over. So it's kind of a process. I have started brainstorming the next challenge. I think we're going to do fillers. I think we're going to do something like the encyclopedia of fillers or like a, a sampler quilt of all different things that you can do. Um, kind of s not similar to the first challenge, but more the first challenge was kind of a, an assortment. So it's going to be something like that. Um, when is it going to be? Well, it just depends on how much I can use my brain to make this happen. I'm tentatively hoping March-ish. 
March. So we'll see. I don't want to do them too soon because I don't want to feel like, you know, oh, I can't get this done, um, but already thinking about it. So definitely. And again, the San Diego retreat, you want to go to eternityquiltevents.com and it's April 1st through the 5th. So I think there was, must have been some questions about that. Um, I'll put a link in the description box. It's going to be a great time. It's quite the, quite the event. It's all inclusive. It includes everything you need to make the two quilts, trunk show, hanging out with me and Camille, um, a good time. So again, April 1st to the 5th in San Diego and Eternity Quilt Events. I will put a um, link about that in the description box. So I know that it's been a busy time of year. So if you have been quilting along, I hope that you're super proud of yourself. I know that it's hard to learn something new. Um, it's not fun when you suck at something, but you have to embrace the suck and get past it. And I promise it gets easier. And you'll be quilting along one of these days and you'll be like, oh my gosh, I found my flow where you can just quilt and your mind can wander and it's almost like meditation. If you're newer to quilting, you're like, it's not like that right now. Lots of cussing, lots of crying, but I promise a little bit of practice, it gets better. So I'm so glad if you quilt along, if you didn't, and I know some people were like, I just haven't got to it, no worries. The challenge videos will stay on my YouTube channel indefinitely. So whenever you're ready, check it out. And in the time between this in the next challenge, if you want to go check out one of my earlier challenges, there's plenty to choose from. This was the 10th one that I've done. So lots of uh, practice. So if your New Year's resolution is to improve your free motion quilting, you can check out those videos. At the very least, I hope you'll join me every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central for our live chat where we'll kind of just talk about quilting. It'll be a fun time. So thanks so much for quilting along with me. I will see you all next year. I love being able to say that for the next week's live chat. Until then, everybody, happy quilting and stay safe.